podcasting from a remote location somewhere deep in the heart of New York City. This is Crypto Characters, and I'm your host, Jason Magic. Our guest for today is Steve Ehrlich, speaker, commentator, author, and all, all around know-it-all on emerging techn- technology, digital banking, and blockchain issues. Steve is currently the chief operating officer of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. It's a non-profit global trade association that focuses on blockchain technology, crypto assets, and developing the field that encompasses all of those things. He was a vice president at City Fintech, which drove the development initiatives in the fintech space for Citigroup's global retail and consumer bank business. Prior to joining Citibank, he was a lead associate for emerging technologies at Spitzberg Partners, and before that, he was a senior intelligence analyst for Booz Allen as a contractor for the Department of Defense. Steve Ehrlich, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about you first. Now, I want to start with the end of that intro, that very impressive intro, because to me, anyone that's in this space that used to, be, that used to work for the Department of Defense as a senior intelligence analyst is an example of the interesting folks that you meet in this space. So tell me this. You started out as, a, as, a, as an intelligence analyst, a senior intelligence analyst, mm-hmm. and now you're in, you're in fintech. What's the bridge there? What, <laughs> what, what, what brought you to, to the intelligence analyst and then brought you over to the fintech side? Sure, that, that's a good way to start. I mean, I think everybody here in the space that's over the age of 24 has some sort of prior history. Or, or background before they before they went full crypto and went down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Well, you know, I graduated from NYU in 1997 with a degree in blockchain technology. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm the only one there. <laughs> maybe maybe perhaps most people, or maybe the people got blockchain technology because they were building blocks with their kids and they, <laughs> <laughs> or they right. became Jenga experts or something <laughs> like that. So uh, you, tell me, how'd, how'd you how'd you do both? Where, where'd you come from? Well, I mean, honestly, I I like. Whenever I, I'm asked to give bios, I, I tend to say one of my claims to fame is that I'm probably one of the few people in the crypto space, although maybe that's changing now with so many um, security researchers and crypt- cryptographers that have come in that has act- actually passed a counterintelligence polygraph test, which was <laughs> definitely the worst experience of my entire life. But Really, uh, it was? Yeah. What yeah. was it like? I'm curious. I, I mean, can't talk too much about but basically you just sit in a room and uh, and you answer questions and, and explain how you're not a spy. Oh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to know any of the details, yeah. but I mean, f- I'd love to hear what that experience feels like. You're sweating the entire oh. time. Oh my, yeah, you're, you're sweating. I mean, it's uh it's one of those things where you kind of feel like in some ways you're, in, you're interviewing for your own job. Uh, and if you don't do it, uh, and if you don't answer the right questions, then, then, but, uh, I mean, potentially the, the the worst thing that can happen is not that you lose your job, but that you go to jail or something. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean that's probably a little bit hyperbolic to, to say, but but I mean it's an uncomfortable situation, and and I mean it's supposed to be. I mean we're in the business of protecting secrets and and highly classified information that people put their lives on the line to obtain to support the U.S. government. So it's important to make sure that uh, the people who are safeguarding the secrets are are trustworthy to do so. But um, but I mean besides that, I. Um, I'd always wanted, I was always really interested in geopolitics and, uh, there's a, sometimes I see something on Twitter, like what is your biggest on brand story? Mine is I was born in 1982. So I was about nine or 10 when the Gulf war broke out. And I remember the Persian Gulf war, the first one and Gulf a lot one. of, yeah, Gulf one, um, storm and Norman. And I remember I used to put together maps of oil fields and, and troop movements with, with one of my friends from grade school. Um, back when Seriously? I was like nine, yeah. So, uh, that was always something I wanted to do. So after I finished college, I went back to grad school, um, did a master's in international relations, moved down to D.C. and 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 got to live my dream for a while as a as a senior senior intelligence analyst for the Department of Defense, which was which was a lot of fun. In uh, in May of 2013, I mean this was a, a, a tough time for anyone working in government. Uh, this was going through a round of sequesters and furloughs, and and there was a lot of staff cutbacks, and and the overall environment wasn't wasn't terrific. Uh, plus, I uh, I fell in love with a, a girl who became my wife and is from New York. So I was kind of looking for something that um, we were looking to move a little bit closer to home and, and also something that would merge my interest in geopolitics, but also with the private sector and, and, and sort of commercial business, so to speak. And that's when I was introduced 
to Spitzberg Partners, in particular their their chairman, a uh, gentleman by the name of Carl Theodor Zugutenberg, who is a former German Minister of Defense and also Minister of Economics and Technology. They were launching this firm, and I was lucky enough to get interviewed and, and brought on to help lead their emerging technology space. And that's actually where um, it, it was within that purview that I got introduced to blockchain technology for the first time because Carl Theodor was good friends with Chris Larson, the founder of Ripple. and. We went out there in December of 2013 and had breakfast with him and Stefan Thomas, who was Ripple's, I believe, first CTO. Well, a funny story about that. So when Carl Theodore was the uh, German defense minister, his, his real like signature crowning achievement was the elimination of conscription, which was which was a big deal. The idea of moving um, from a forced army to, to an all volunteer force. It's it's a when did that happen? Uh, it happened. I don't know, maybe like eight, nine, ten years ago at this point. Okay. So, uh, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, I mean, it, it's a pretty big revamp of how the country organizes its armed forces. And obviously yeah. they're a NATO ally. So it, it's critical for the safe, the safety of the United States that um, these things are done responsibly. Turns out that Stefan Thomas was really interested in meeting Carl Theodore because he's German. And if Carl Theodore had not eliminated the draft, he or eliminated conscription, so to speak, he would have actually had to serve in the German army instead of helping build Ripple in 2013, 2014, 2015. So, wow. So, I mean, Stefan's one of those people that most people try to meet and have pictures taken with. And in, mm -hmm. in this particular scenario, it was the other way around where he, well, he wanted to meet somebody else. And then from there, I mean, we, we, we um, looked at Ripple, worked with them on business development and regulatory initiatives, looked at, and then we, that's, that was our first real introduction to blockchain technology. And from there, then we, saw its applicability to data storage and identity and, and a suite of other issues. And, and that's kind of where we got, that's sort of my introduction. And then from there, I went to Citibank for a year. Well, hold on, before I get to Citibank, and that's a pretty cool introduction to the crypto world. I mean, you're talking with the founders of, of Ripple about mm -hmm. what they did. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. What was that like? It was, uh, I mean, it was, it was fun. I mean, frankly, uh, at that time, I mean, that was my very, very, very early introduction to crypto. So a lot of it still kind of went over my head. I mean, this was even when, uh, I mean, nowadays I could talk for hours about the difference between Ripple and Bitcoin. But even right. at that point, I was still trying to figure it out. And frankly, we all were. So, I mean, it was, I mean, it was very, very basic level discussions. But you got really excited about it. And, and one of the things that really drew our firm to to Ripple was the sense, I mean, this is something that they're getting criticized for in some regards now, but the idea that they're, they're trying to work on the back end of bank systems, working on interbank payments that don't necessarily touch the consumer. Uh, I mean, th we thought that was, and, and still do, it is a smart approach for the type of business they're trying to get because it means you really only have to win over the banks and the IT and the regulators. You don't have to worry about consumer adoption because Theoretically, the front end for the consumer would stay the same, regardless of whatever the rails are that a payment would go, would go on. So, so that was that was something that we got excited about, and and obviously um, as a company based in the U.S. but with strong roots in in Central Europe and Germany in particular, uh, I mean, we saw a lot of uh, we saw a lot of, a lot of value to be had on helping Ripple expand onto into Europe. So let's talk a little bit about what Ripple's business model is, because to me. It really is a perfect example of what blockchain is good for. W why don't you just talk a little bit without endorsing any of it? W what types of criticism is Ripple getting now for working with the banks? Is it just the, what's the best way to describe it, the libertarian anti-government angle that people are complaining with Ripple about, or are there other things? Sure, so I, th I think there's two real lines of criticism that Ripple's face. I mean, for one, there's a there's no real uh, uniformity around the uh, around whether or not Ripple should or the XR, XRP Ripple's native token should be considered a security. Uh, I mean, they the company will tell you it's not a security. Uh, I think a number of class action lawsuits. I believe there was one in California in particular that there would was, yeah. that would that would suggest otherwise. And uh, I mean, the the real idea is that I mean, Ripple, the company will say that they were gifted the XRP that they have in their treasury and they, they sell it, but they didn't necessarily create it, and that they're building a distributed ledger. But at the same time, they're building a distributed ledger that, that is somewhat permissioned, where people can choose which validators they want to help uh, maintain the fidelity of the payment networks that they're building. So I, mean, there, I think there is a credible argument to be made that 
there are some centralizing forces within the company. How that falls falls under directly under the Howey test and other uh, similar tests around the world to determine whether or not something is a security is probably for people like yourself to decide who are who are lawyers. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but or I, judges or or judges <laughs> or judges. But uh, but there's enough there's enough information there's enough ambiguity that I think strong arguments can be made for either side, and and that's something that rubs a lot of people the wrong way when they feel that crypto and blockchain should be decentralized and 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 they'll say that ripple is not uh and, and then the other part too is, is the fact that again people can cho- people can choose which validators that they want to have so you don't have to have nearly as many nodes as there are on the bitcoin blockchain or, or ethereum and so on and so forth so it's really like is this permission is it not and then that gets into the deeper question of do we actually want to be a hundred percent decentralized or is some degree of centralization a good thing as it pertains to, to particular use cases. So I, I think Ripple is a really fascinating company because it's, it's highly capitalized. They have a lot of very smart people. I mean, they're going after, uh, I think they have over 100 plus X partners at, at this point, although I don't think many of them actually use XRP, the currency in, in their implementations. But I mean, they're doing a lot of really great things. They're one of the they're one of the few blue blood crypto companies out there, but they fit directly on a lot of these fault lines that are, are sort of really kind of gets at the heart of what is the point of crypto. So it's a great company to study. When you say blue blood, what do you mean? Blue blood, uh, just kind of, uh, I, I, I mean, I like it almost in the context of uh, like college sports or something. Like if you think of college basketball, the, the blue bloods are, are Kentucky and Kansas and Duke and North Carolina. And, and I'm a Villanova fan, so I'll throw Villanova in there too. But, but <laughs> Did I, you I, go I, there for school? No, I, I didn't. Okay. I, uh, I, I uh, went to Carnegie Mellon. All right. Actually. But, uh, but I mean, basically a, a handful of companies that are the ones that you put out there and everybody knows and, and, and more or less like associate the fortunes of the entire industry with how they go. So, I mean, I would put uh, like Ripple and, and Coinbase out there for, for instance, as, a, as another company that would be considered a, a blue blood. Okay, makes sense. All right, so you start working your intro into crypto with, with Ripple, which is really cool. And um, where'd you go from there? So from there, I mean, we, we on a project basis because we, we we went through you know the different places that you worked at, but I don't yeah. know that the places matter as much as kind of your journey. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. So I mean, a lot of the projects that we worked on are, aren't things that we can necessarily necessarily talk about too much, but I mean, where we tried to position Spitzberg Partners and and the company still does. I mean, for full disclosure, I'm still an advisor there, so I, I do some work for them. We really our value add to clients was that we understood their business models and simultaneously understood how blockchain could come in. They, they were getting inundated with information and, and hyperbolic tweets and articles like saying that anything that was created before the release of the Bitcoin white paper on, I think it was Halloween night of 2008, is irrelevant. And we're all gonna, you're all going to be out of business in five years, 10 years, two years, whatever it is. Wait, there are tweets you can't trust? Hmm? There are tweets you can't trust? Believe it or not, uh, so not you can't re- believe everything that you hear what on the did, internet. What did you call them? What was a great name for the something, some kind of tweets. I, I, I didn't catch it. I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't In, remember. Okay, well, anyway. uh, no. when we listen to it, I'm going to use that. <laughs> I'm going to write it down and use it. No, mm-hmm. no full, uh, I think I signed a release. So go, go <laughs> right at it. But, uh, but basically, a lot of these established institutions in the financial sector or even other places, logistics, uh, mining, resource extraction. They understood that blockchain technology with its ability to offer additional transparency, the immutable nature uh, of it to help uh, with with data reconciliation, Um, some of the ways that it uses encryption to help authenticate individuals has has value, but they also got that this is very, very early and they were smart enough to realize that there's a lot that they don't understand about it. So they saw us, and when I say us, I mean, I mean Spitzberg Partners at the time, as a, uh, as a sort of a trusted source, and this is something our uh, the WSBA CEO, Ron Caranta, always likes to liken the WSBA to, but they, they saw us as a trusted source where we could help them kind of pull out the aspects of blockchain technology that would be most relevant to their business and could help them sort of create a strategy and implement it incrementally to, to create value. And that's, those are the types of projects that we worked on. So we wanted to, what we, basically what we said is that we didn't necessarily want to ruin whatever the secret sauce was that made these companies so successful. And, and when I say these companies without mentioning names, I mean, these are companies 
uh, in like the Fortune 500. I mean, these are companies that have been around for decades and have gone through multiple levels of of leadership changes that get passed on from fa one family member of one generation to another to another. So these are companies that have lived through a lot. I mean, they've gone through the internet age. They've gone through plenty of other um, plenty plenty of other technological disruptions. So I mean, they want to kind of navigate blockchain in the same regard, and that's that's where we came in because we could speak credibly to both sides. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about digital identity because I know it's one of the things that you love to talk about. And we'll talk about some other things that are in the news as well. But digital identity, mm -hmm. give us the basics, break it out, because I think everyone that watches, that, that watches or listens to this podcast generally understands the basics of blockchain. How is it being used? Well, let's just talk about the basics of what it is and how it's being used in order to help with people's identity and to secure people's identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as, as you said, this is some, it's sort of a passion project of mine i whenever I, I speak at a conference or or, an, or on a uh a, a highly respected podcast such as this one i uh listen we have six followers by the way <laughs> so it's, well, it's highly respected well, I'm, I'm signing up my wife and my kids so we're, <laughs> we're going to be up to about nine or ten I'm, I'm guessing my parents will probably do it as well but uh i always like to say i mean i, I went to college with some of the earliest employees of facebook and right. i can't imagine that when mark zuckerberg created it in his dorm room in 2013 and we've all heard the story or seen it romanticized in his congressional testimony or on the social network or whatever was it 2013 2003 oh, okay, 2000, okay. Yeah, okay 2000. did i say 2013 yeah okay Sorry. yeah yeah <laughs> 2003 i'm a technological fool so yeah. you know for all i knew that was wow that was really that was, they did really good <laughs> no, in no, six I, years <laughs> no thanks thanks for catching that uh, but i mean the idea that the idea that nowadays like facebook would be creating some sort of stable coin i mean some type of cryptocurrency getting involved in payments i mean i mean that was so far removed from what it was originally intended to be and at some point the the company sort of transitioned from a fun project to to money making business i mean i, I know that uh mark zuckerberg when he was in his congressional testimony he always talked about how he just created this because he wanted people to be able to um, look and see pictures of friends and figure out if someone was single or, or not but at some point, once they started taking VC money, once they went public, I mean, they were acquiring WhatsApp and Oculus and, and making really like concerted business decisions because they had a, a responsibility to their shareholders. Right. And to do that, I mean, in their that centralized data model, I mean, that they always have to keep feeding the beast, for lack of a better term. They always have to, they have to get more data. They have to analyze it better because 99% of the revenue, if anyone looks at it from their 10Ks, I think they brought in somewhere close to like $40 million last year in revenue, or maybe it was... 2017, I don't know if the 2018 filings come out yet, mm -hmm. came from advertising. The reason they can charge fees is because they offer people advertisements that are relevant to their interests, ideally timed when they're looking to buy something. Right. And they have to keep doing that. They have to, they have to keep growing because if you like, you don't stay still, you either go forward, you go backwards, but, but you don't stay still. Like Kodak, right? Exactly. So when you think about it from at that perspective, we don't we're not and and I, sometimes i don't want to come off as like i'm criticizing facebook because i don't know if i would have necessarily done anything different if i came up with the idea i mean sometimes it's just a matter of, of timing and circumstances when you do certain things but i see a need for like a, a a complete inversion of how we relate to these companies technologically i mean this was something that really became apparent to me when i when i had children and they grew up they were born in the facebook age so theoretically their entire lives could be on Facebook. If I mean, because I mean, I, I put on baby pictures, and I'm sure a lot oh, of other people. Oh, you did. You put that stuff. I up, actually yeah. deleted Facebook this week um, for 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 other reasons, but uh, right. um, but but you do because you want to because I mean, there's a lot of good in it. I mean, you want to share photos. You want people to see what's going on. I mean, we have I have friends all over the world. I would assume you do too. It's hard to stay in touch with all of them. So it, it, there's a lot of utility to it, but at the same time, there's this other like like pernicious downside that that is that you can't disassociate the two. And if there's a way that we can be the ones that are fundamentally in charge of our information and can decide who has access to it for what purposes and utilize like smart contracts and to, to really like programmatically ensure that whatever conditions we set on our data are followed, that's something that's very appealing. And to be honest, until blockchain technology really came out and we started thinking about the applicability of it to digital identity, I, I didn't think it was possible. But now that I saw this, I, I think that th there's no other way to do it in the future that that's responsible. And 
and there's a lot of different variants of it, which I, I, I'm guessing we, we could talk about, but the, at, a, at a very high level, that, that's why I get so excited about it. So, so tell me this, how do you do it? Let's just start with the basics. So, all right, there is some way to, is it safeguard or monetize your data? What levels are we talking about with digital identity? Let's start there. There's a couple levels. I mean, you have to build one on top of the other. I mean, for one thing, uh, when I talk about this, I often mention a few different terms that people tend to conflate but actually have very different definitions. One is data security. Data security basically means that you have the appropriate physical, technical, and administrative safeguards to protect your information from unwanted uh, access. I mean, for instance, if you have a data center, do you have a security guard out front? Or, I mean, do you have an appropriate, uh, some sort of firewall that, uh, or antivirus software that um, is up, kept up to date for the latest virus signatures? I mean, that's the type of stuff that you use. And, or, or do you keep information in plain text or do you keep it encrypted? Because uh, obviously if encrypted data is stolen, as long as they don't have the decryption key, um, it should basically be useless to, to, uh, to the attacker. So data security is a prerequisite for anything related to privacy. Privacy basically means that data is governed in a responsible manner, that it's only collected for the right purposes and it's only utilized for those intended purposes. And then data protection is kind of everything that, it's sort of the, the summation of the two. So it's sort of building, you can't have data privacy without data security. You can't have data protection, full data protection without both of these components. So where do we start? So, I mean, there's a few different ways that y you can look at it. I mean, the real pie in the sky scenario is something called self-sovereign identity, where basically that means that uh, you or I are the complete arbiter of our information. We're the only ones that have the, the private keys. We're the only ones that are able to control that, control that data. And, and typically, I mean, what that would, there, there's a couple different ways it could work. I mean, for one, there are some companies out there in the blockchain space that are trying to create distributed storage mechanisms like storage and, and Filecoin and so on and so forth, okay. where theoretically your data could be, um, could, be, could be stored online in a blockchain similar to what happens with BitTorrent now, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system. And, and then what you could do is you could create sort of a wallet where you generate a private key, uh, a public key, create a unique identifier, register it all to the blockchain to show that you're the one that owns that information. And, and then you can basically put your data up onto a blockchain and encumber it with a smart contract that says like only you with your private key are allowed to send it or allowed to do, do whatever with it. So that that's the real full on um, like, um, like, um, like purebred self-driven identity solution where you, you keep track of all of your information it's up there and you can choose who has access to it for for what purposes but you can only get to that if you have everything on a blockchain essentially right? yeah you can so uh, and you can so there's a lot of technological challenges to that i mean for one I mean, it's not a secret to, to, to either one of us or i guess most listeners on your podcast that there are very few if any real applications that have gotten that type of, of usage so that's one big challenge the second one is is what uh I like to call the grandma scenario. And uh, Okay, let's hear it. So I was at a I was speaking at a conference in DC, must have been about two years ago. Okay. On a panel about blockchain and identity. And I think uh on the panel was Jamie Smith who uh w was previously ran I think PR for uh Bitfury. Uh Andrea Tiniano was on it, uh, of Glo uh the Delaware Blockchain Initiative, who was a uh, you know a good friend to both of us and I believe she was on the show earlier. That's right. Uh, Juan Janos was on, who is uh, a well-known entrepreneur in the space and also an advisor to the WSBA. Andrea is the, the chair of our enterprise solutions working group. But in any case, we, we had a panel about blockchain, identity, privacy, so on and so forth. And then Dave Perch, the CEO of Consult Hyperion, who's one of the, one of the, if not like the preeminent like thinker on digital identity. And, and this is not just blockchain identity. This is like anything related to digital identity. Okay. Raised his hand and said, well, what happens if I have a, an SSI system, self sovereign identity, and someone calls my grandma and steals her identity? If it's all, and it's all on blockchain, there's no one to call, there's no third party. It's just out there. Does that, does that mean grandma's, does that mean grandma's identity is gone? She's lost control of it forever. And basically said, how many people are going to want to, how many people are going to trust that? Like, like how important is it to that many people to have total control over their identity that they're willing to use a system like that where there's basically no recovery if they lose access to their private keys right or they so and, and that's a fair question i mean that i mean that's something that we talk about 
a lot in day to day at the WSBA and wherever else. I mean, how much autonomy or decentralization is really necessary? Do we want 100 percent or do we want a little bit more um, decentralization than we have today? And that, that's an important question to ask. And so actually, you just there was you just wrote an article about that for the water cooler section of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, right? Or somebody that I was I was reading about what le how much do we really want of centralization versus decentralization? Yeah, I have. I mean, that's probably come up. Um, it, I'd be curious if you know which exact water cooler article that was uh, that was in for for all of your listeners who are interested. Every every Saturday, we for our WSBA members, we write a we write an installment of something we call the WSBA water uh, crypto water cooler, where we talk about a couple of stories that were really newsworthy over the week and sort of discuss some higher level issues or some topics that would be worthy of mention within our, our working groups, but. The, the centralization versus decentralization topic comes up in, in almost all aspects or all applications of blockchain technology. Uh, and I mean, one example that I, I know I wrote about in the, I'm not sure if it was a water cooler, but one of the op-eds I wrote for, for the WSBA was looking it at- It might have been that. Bit, Bitmain, I'm sorry, not Bitmain, Binance, the, the world's largest uh, crypto exchange, mm -hmm. is actively shifting from a centralized model to a decentralized model. And, and there's a lot that kind of goes along with that because I mean, a centralized model is much more efficient if you're trying to match orders and create liquidity because things can just be done quickly. Um, th things can be things can be executed very fast. Not every transaction has to be added onto a blockchain, for instance. I mean, there's just it's just simpler. So it's good for trading. In other words, it's good for transferring money. It, it is, but at the same time, a, a centralized exchange, as we just saw from Bitthum in, in South Korea, that was hacked again um, for the second time this year. I think this time to the tune of I believe $20 million, and I, I think they believe it was an insider attack. Whenever things are centralized, that means that there's a risk of, of there's a single point of failure, single point of failure. There's a risk of theft. Something is decentralized where it's a decentralized exchange where people actually control their own custody, their own keys, and everything happens without really some central clearinghouse. Well, just describe what custody and keys are. Sure. So, I mean, when you say you control your own custody and your own keys. Brief, briefly. So, yeah, so most people, uh, a lot of people that invest in crypto have probably purchased it through something like Coinbase or, or Circle or um, Poloniex or Bittrex, uh, any, of these other, any of these exchanges. And you'll pull it up on your app and you'll see, look, I have a balance of X number of Bitcoin and Ether and Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash and whatever else. What you don't realize is that theoretically, you really, you really those aren't, yours i mean you you have a right to those coins but those coins are controlled by coinbase or whatever the exchange is if they are hacked and those coins are are, are wiped away you can't get them back i mean you don't actually if you don't control your private keys and on coinbase or any of those accounts you have <coughs> access to your public keys so you can send and receive but you don't have um the, the private ones you don't at the end of the day you don't truly control your crypto and this is something that was really the 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 force or I, I guess the, the the rationale behind the proof of keys movement that came out in January led by Caitlin Long and I think a couple other people where they actually encouraged people to try to download the private keys and move their money off of exchanges so that they could see how what it means to truly control your money and so essentially when people say custody and controlling your keys what it really means is that if you have a wallet which is just an address where you store your your Bitcoin or any sort of digital asset, then that comes with a key. And as long as you are the only one that has the key, then you are the custodian of, th of those digital assets and they're yours. And the only way that you can lose them is if you lose your private key or someone takes your private key and transfers it to their own address, correct? Generally right. speaking? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now getting back to, to public and private keys and the proof of keys, let's talk about that and then we can jump back into the way that implicates digital identity. How does that sound? Sure. So uh, so what's the proof of keys movement? I've heard of that, but I don't really know that I understand it exactly. So, I mean, it really was just something to raise awareness in the space that people don't recognize how centralized some, some aspects of the industry truly are. I mean, I, again, just going back to the example, if you go pull up your Coinbase account, you'll see what you owe or you'll see what you own, but you don't fully control what ha what what happens, or you don't fully control what happens to those crypto assets because if they get stolen, 
by some outside attacker or insider threat, you may not necessarily be able to get those back. They're, they're not FDIC insured, and, and frankly, because you don't control your private key, which and the private key is really what a private key is how someone authorizes transactions as it pertains to the money that they hold. You don't have full control over those assets. So the proof of keys movement was encouraging people to take their money off of these centralized exchanges to um, to their own wallets or to non-custodial types of exchanges so that they could see what it really means to control their own money. So it was really an awareness initiative. Yeah, it was. Okay. All right. So now let's go, let's jump back into digital identity. So we've got the self-sovereign ID. You have issues about whether or not having all of your information on the blockchain, all of it available, whether that's worth, whether the risk of well, losing it's, your it's, key. It's not even having all the information on, on a blockchain. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I mean, obviously that is, I mean, there's always a, con you're not gonna be able to obviate all security threats, regardless of if you keep your information on some sort of blockchain, you keep it in uh, a public cloud, like AWS, Google Drive, or, or iCloud, whatever it is, but it's more, do you want total control with no recoverability? Like that's, that's, the, that's the real problem. And that's the same for if it's your identity and all of your associated like healthcare records and pictures and whatever, or your money. I mean, at the same time, like people want to, it, if, I, if I decided that I want to control all of my assets on my own and take care of my own security, that's not something I wouldn't sleep very well at night because right. I mean, if you lose it, you You're lose done. it. I mean, it, it's gone. It, so I mean, at what point is it worth it? Like, I, I, obviously, it's a risk. I mean, the financial sector is always. I mean, there's always some level of risk about it. But is the risk higher or lower than me doing something stupid with my password and losing all my money? It's it's probably lower than that. So that gets that gets the Definitely. question of at least for me. It yeah. is. So that gets the question of how much centralization is really necessary. And returning to the identity question. So self-serving identity is something that that is that 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 is important. It is a value, and I'm not trying. And there are the people who are building these products are aware of those challenges. I mean, that I just mentioned about the recoverability. I mean, there's issues like, I mean, there's thoughts that if an X number of people could could val uh, could vouch for someone's identity, perhaps they could recover the keys. I mean, there there's some right. solutions trying to be created out there, so they are aware of the problems. But at the same time, there are more valid use cases that could be implemented quicker on permission change, per, uh, permission uh, ledgers. For instance, within the banking sector, I mean, I imagine most of your listeners are aware of things like the GDPR and payments and PD, PSD2, the second payment services directive in the EU, and, and just generally this more movement towards open banking driven by APIs where people can solicit financial services from a wide spectrum of providers. Well, to, to do we, a lot We of just had someone here talking about GDPR and blockchain. Okay, so. great. So. Yeah. So it hasn't been released yet, so, you know, okay. it's, it's timely. <laughs> Very nice. But but anyway, I mean, to do that, I mean, say like, I wanted to get a credit card from Bank of America. I wanted to get a, a CD from, from JP. I wanted to have a, a savings account at Citibank, and, and say I wanted to open a brokerage account at, at Goldman or whatever it is. Okay. I, I would have to do separate uh, – um, I'd have to go through four separate onboarding procedures, with, um, right. doing AML, KYC, and all that sort of stuff. Imagine if all those banks just got together and agreed to build, uh, some sort of consortia-based approach where they can share AML KYC data with each other, and, and tokenized or, or, or otherwise, and and basically it would help me get services faster because I wouldn't have to go through this pain point every single time. So they're doing that in Europe? No, I'm not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of pilots going on. I, I just picked those banks as a, for instance. I mean, I mean, in the news we can tell those are all based on doing some things related to blockchain, but... Right. Uh, I'm just trying to talk about the general trend that's been driven partially by technology, partially by regulation, that people don't want to just have one bank and use that as sort of the, the purveyor of every service that they have. They want to be able to choose. They want to be able, I mean, they want to be, almost be able to buy banking products like they like they buy uh, flights, okay. like looking at different, uh, different prices and, and do you want to stop over here versus there? They want it to be just as easy to do that. And in order to make that process simple, you have to have a way to, to port relevant onboarding data between these different providers. So the idea of perhaps do, these providers, I mean, banks, are they'll never trust this information to a public chain because right. they're not going to, I mean, they don't know they who's on it. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, from a regulatory perspective, they'll never do it. So they may need to have a permissioned approach, uh, a consortium maybe built on like Hyperledger Fabric, R3's Corda, 
so on so and so forth. So when you say permissioned approach, what you're essentially saying is that it's a proprietary blockchain that there are administrators on and only people that are part of the group mm -hmm. that are led in essentially by the administrator, they're the only ones that have access. Exactly. Right? Yeah, only okay. authenticated nodes are allowed to join. And, and, and those don't only, I mean, a lot of times we tend to conflate like Bitcoin, a bl blockchain and DLT. Um, you uh, blockchain is a type of distributed ledger technology with some of these solutions. It, it's not like every transaction is added block by block built on top of each other and transparent to the entire network. With some of these, for instance, it could be only parties can only see transactions that they are directly a part of. Um, but then it would be a permissioned. Yeah, permission. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a permission ledger, but it's, it's a, diff a slightly different architecture than, than, uh, than a pure blockchain. But that, that, that's, a, that's a whole other story. But the idea is just that there's the viability of this technology to use cases that aren't strictly just based on complete, purely decentralized self-sovereign identity. I, th I think there's a role for self-SSI, uh, especially in perhaps like economies with more corrupt governments or people that are unbanked that maybe don't have a persistent ID. Uh, around the world, I think there's about two billion people that still don't have a, a proper um, proper identification. I mean, that might be more of a role for it, but I, I think that there, there's multiple paths up the mountain is probably the best way to put it. So, all right, we've got the top level, which is SSI. What's the what's the next level down for uh, digital identity? I, I mean, right now I, I look at it mostly as I mean, there's some SSI stuff with third-party recovery tools. Uh, what do you mean? Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's there's some SSI programs out there where if you want to, you could choose to, to, to store some type of key backup on like a third party cloud software okay. with a recovery phase that if you want, um, you, if you lose your key, you could recover it there. Obviously, that, that brings in a, a, a little bit of a level of centralization. There, there's some other tools that are, are not necessarily designed to sort of like replicate social media, but for instance, could tokenize your ID. So uh, like, like Showcard and Civic and so on and so forth, where... Mm -hmm you sort of basically hash different parts of your ID and you can like offer that as a, as a way of validating who you are without even necessarily having to say who you are. Is but that what they call sharding? S-H-A-R-D-I-N-G? No, no, sharding is something a little bit different. Sharding, uh, it's a bad name to use. They should find a better <laughs> name for that, by the way. I, I'm not the expert on, on sharding, but I mean, basically where I see it, it's designed to help with the scalability of networks I mean, basically within proof of work in bitcoin proof of work the idea is that every why don't you define what proof of work is too okay so pr so basically if you have a decentralized network like bitcoin or or ethereum you have to have some way for all these disparate nodes to be able to stay in sync and validate which nodes uh, which trans authentic transactions and make sure that they're all working on what is considered to be like the longest chain the the, the one that has the most work done well, they do okay. this um, in order to make sure that they all remain in sync. These various nodes are simultaneously validating transactions, making sure that, uh, for instance, the sender has the, the correct amount of funds to send, has sufficient funds to send it to a receiver. And at the same time, they're, they're taking these transactions, putting them into blocks, and at the same time, they're racing against each other to solve a very complex computational problem. And... Uh, and and that's what's known as the work. I I, I I can't explain exactly what the problem is. It's it's something that uh, it, it deals with all these weird terms. But essentially, like non nonces, and you have to you have to basically find a you have to like run a hashing algorithm to find a number that that where like I think like the first couple numbers fall within a certain criteria. We, and we don't need to get into yeah. the weeds on that. But but it, but the, uh, so proof of work the proof essentially of work is like Bitcoin, where you're Bitcoin you're Ethereum, racing. You're racing. You to are, and the, the idea is that you're lending your computer power, which means you have to buy you have to buy the equipment you have to pay for electricity you have to give up something of value in order to uh in order to process transactions and you get rewards and transaction fees for doing this but the idea is that there has to be some sort of commitment on, on the miners part on the nodes part otherwise anybody could just set up miners and the network would lose all of its fidelity so that's sort of a way of aligning incentives so that people that are working on the network are all doing it for the right purposes and then when a block explain that one again i i didn't think Never thought about it that way. Can you say that one again? Well, so. the idea is, I mean, if, if it if so, you have to spend money. Well, you have to spend money in the sense that it costs money. I mean, most of the days, today, I mean, to to mine, I mean, you have to buy ASICs. I mean, you have to buy which, which uh, is a type of computer yeah, process, application right? specific integrated circuits. That uh, those are the chips that go into these miners, where they just get loaded with these miners, and basically, as opposed to like a a general purpose uh, 
computer chip that can do a, a range of functions like things that you'd find in a, in a like laptop. A laptop, right? Uh, like these ASICs can only really do one thing, which means they can mine, they can run the hashing algorithm that is utilized in a particular type of network, and they can do it very, very quickly. But that's all that they can do. If you make like one little tweak to it, it changes, and it can almost become bricked in, in some regards. But bricked, what does that mean? It useless. So, essentially. And I haven't heard it this way, so it's an interesting way to think about it. The fact that you've got to go and invest time and money into purchasing yeah. GPUs, right? They're, they're also called, or, or ASICs, what are they? I mean, are well, they the, the same the, thing? The, no, so originally when, when, I mean, when Bitcoin was first created, the idea was that people would be able to uh, to run them, Using run mining nodes on, on right? CPUs, like like, like right. the, the, um, the processing units that come in everyday laptops. Then... Right. It moved up to GPUs, which have higher processing power because they're more, they're used more for like gaming laptops and and some of the more computation computationally intensive applications that you see on those, and then eventually, because of the the value of Bitcoin or Ether or uh, some of the other currencies kept going up, people wanted to mine them more, which led to investment in in ASICs and and these very very expensive computer computing systems to buy and operate. So there's a real cost to it. But if there wasn't, then theoretically anybody. So with this cost, the incentive is people want the miners need to make sure that the network maintains its fidelity, because if it doesn't, they primarily get rewarded in cryptocurrency. And if people don't trust it, demand for it will plummet and they'll lose their entire investment. So if there wasn't some sort of cost associated with it, then anybody here could just set up nodes and do whatever they wanted with it because there's no penalty. It's the same reason why n nowadays there's a move to proof of stake, which is an additional, a different way of achieving consensus, where instead of using very computationally intensive equipment, which uh, has actually come under some criticism for its environmental impact. Power usage, right? Yeah, power usage and, and, and the associated carbon footprint that that creates, people are instead, of, are instead putting up their assets as collateral. And if they don't act, appropriately as a, as a node on a network, they, they risk a forfeiture of, of those assets. So basically there has to be a way, um, a carrot and stick approach and uh, proof of work and proof of stake do it in different, different, fa different ways. You know, it's fascinating to me every time I talk about this, when you talk about Bitcoin and really money, essentially electronic money, digital assets, that it always comes down to governance, mm -hmm. which, is somewhat ironic given the anti-government lilt of so many of the of of the diehards and the people that really started the cryptocurrency it it never ceases to i never cease to find that ironic because really when you're getting into the details about what these things do governance is a giant part of it N now is there a way that governance can help us with digital identity so it's funny. I uh, when we talk about governance. I mean, part of my background, I, I did a master's in international relations, and uh, and I wrote an article in Forbes called uh, I think something like "Will Crypto Fall Victim to the Tragedy of Great Power Politics?" I and, think I uh, might have read that <laughs> one. Yeah. And I, uh, I I I I've been told I'm the first person ever to use uh, the the terms crypto and democratic peace theory in the same article. <laughs> It's, which, uh, it's pretty I don't, interesting. I don't, so I don't know if that's a good thing or, or a bad thing. Did, but you, did you come to a conclusion about that in the article? Not, not yeah. really. I mean, basically, the, the idea behind the article was, was just that if you look at geopolitics, especially at, uh, I think, at the international level, there were, there's, it's hard to trust, it's hard to trust people um, because, I mean, there's a few different schools of thought, but the idea is, um, at the end of the day, people still, when they want to look at, at at countries and try to figure out their intentions, it's hard to know that. But you can count the number of guns they have. You can count the size of their economy. And, and, and at some point, it's hard to feel safe and, and secure if somebody has more than you. Because depending on a change in governance or, or whatever, it, I mean, it's hard to future-proof your, your security. And, and I think I wrote it in the context. But but at the same time, like that's, that's kind of known more as like the realist theory where of international politics where basically the world is anarchic and everyone, uh, every country or, or nation state or whatever the organizing principle is at that time of day, most people don't realize that nation states are still a relatively modern phenomena. I think it 
they were first created at the Treaty of Westphalia in like 1648. I was just going to say that. Was it was it 1648 Westphalia? I, think, of Westphalia? I, I think so. Okay. I could be wrong. Th- I mean, uh, that was when everyone agreed that we should stop invading people because they're more different from us. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> but, but um, so that, I don't know. Do I, I wonder, though, I, I feel like the nation states were around way before that. They were just less, there wasn't formal recognition of, of one to the other. But I understand why why well, it's said I mean that I mean there there's empires and I mean I mean I mean try, I mean I mean there was always some sort of organizing principle but the idea of nation states with like defined territorial boundaries that are more or less respected I mean obviously not completely because we still have wars but but that idea I mean but the world is anarchic and the central principle of that is that there was no higher governing body than the nation state everyone has the same rights and privileges um, different capabilities, but the same rights and privileges. That's still true, by the way. That, yeah, I mean that is still true today. I mean, some people might argue that the UN is a is a global governing body, no, or it's not. a world government. Uh, it's a bunch of people that get together and talk a lot and don't pay taxes in New York City. <laughs> we'll we'll disagree on that. I, um, but but uh, but there is a belief. I mean, that there's a realist approach, and there's also a, a liberal approach, or uh, uh, the more modern like. In, in, um, uh, incarnation in, in, uh, modern incarnation yeah, yeah you're right of it is like something that's like liberal institutionalism where basically we built these institutions like the Bretton Woods Agreement the UN NATO uh, uh, IMF like things like that where we essentially build these these, these more multinational organizations that build in rights uh, like norms and procedures that are commonly accepted and the idea there is uh, the idea there is that if people sort of even if the nation state is still like the the, the ultimate authority that people try to like work together un- under the framework and auspices, auspices of these groups that are built together. Um, so that's actually, it's kind of like the, the U S government and all the regulatory bodies that we have. It's effectively the same thing. Yeah, it's similar. They're different and versions of, of, of some sort of United tr- treaty that certain countries will agree to like the IMF. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, and that's all, so yeah, and that's, and, and China's people, there's concern that China's doing that now with blockchain in Asia, trying to get everybody involved. Like they're, um, their, their, their modern Silk Road or Silk Road, Silk Belt, Silk Belt, whatever whatever it's called these days. I mean, right. they're trying to appropriate blockchain to bring everybody into some sort of economic uh, trade finance system that, that they control. But but there, there's an idea there that there could be some work together. And then the third real s- school of thought in international politics, and I'm sure this is exactly what we thought about discussing today, <laughs> is constructivism. And basically the idea that people organize around central norms and principles, and that's sort of how they read each other and, and interoperate. And Basically, the idea behind that article is that blockchain, especially within, and this actually is relevant for open or permission or permissionless blockchains, we need to figure out where we where it fits within these three schools of thought. I, I didn't necessarily give an answer. I would my my kind of like my postulation was that people tend to think that it falls more into constructivist realm, where we're all trying to create this decentralized utopia and, and every like the rising tide lifts all boats and we're, we're gonna, all going to help each other. I would argue, though, especially as this, this bear market is continued to be uh, protracted, budgets are going to come under, budgets are going to start to um, come under attack. There's going to be some less money to go around until we find sustainable use cases for this crypto. And people... and Companies are going to have to make hard choices about do we join R3, do we join Hyperledger, do we do our own thing? That, that's just a for, a for instance. And there's going to be, I mean, there's going to be some uh, some battle lines drawn between different groups, different permissions, different consortias. And it, it could be a good thing because it'll cull some of the, the weaker projects. I mean, we see ICOs falling every day now because they had no business raising the money that they raised. But it'll raise some hard questions. It, it leads to some hard questions about what the future of the crypto ecosystem is going to look like. And that's sort of what I was getting at. Like how do, how does crypto fall under these three categories and, and what can we learn from geopolitics that could perhaps help us navigate this in a way that doesn't create consternation among all of us? Well, I think it's a really good point because we don't attend the, the, the agreement that underlies cryptocurrency or blockchain in general tends to be, under discussed at least in the public zeitgeist you know everyone is talking about values which is to me another another thing that i've always found to be bemusing i mean whether it's mm. real money or digital assets i've always found that to be uh, somewhat difficult to really get a hold of but governance for blockchain for cryptocurrency is an important thing that we need to discuss and we need to come to some conclusions about it in order for 
the development to get adopted, I would think. Yeah, and, and I was just, that, that's a good point. I mean, I was just talking about my, uh, I guess my previous uh, monologue there, I was just talking about it at, at like the systemic level, but governance within blockchains is something that's critical too, because again, it gets to the point of, do we want, how much governance is a good thing? Do we want to just write the code and away we go? Or do we want somebody that when grandma gets her ID stolen, you can call and, and recover that information? I mean, how do you, I mean, what's the right, what's the right blend? I mean, we tend to say that within blockchain that there's trade-offs between scalability, privacy, and centralization. It's hard to max out all three. You have to kind right. of weight them and optimize them based on whatever the purpose is that you're going for, like how regulated the industry is or the use cases that you're, you're trying to find and everyone's got to figure it out for themselves. And, and even something like Bitcoin where people say, well, there's no central party, there's no governance. There still is. I mean, if you think about the number of developers and I mean, there is a, dedicated process to integrate protocol updates into the system. Same thing with, with Ethereum. And I mean, everyone's agreeing all the, all of the major miners are the ones that are agreeing to this stuff, right? Well, well it, it, sometimes, I mean, the, the miners represent like one group, one party, the developers are another, they don't, they don't always agree. I mean, for instance, I mean, that's why we have so many variants of Bitcoin. There was a whole Bitcoin scaling debate where, uh, I mean, and without getting, I mean, that's a whole nother podcast to get into all the, all the discussions surrounding that in like 2016, 2017, but basically we wanted to find ways to increase the scalability of, uh, of the throughput of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a cap of, I think one megabyte of data that can be integrated into a blockchain, which I think correlates to about 13 transactions a second. Right. Well, these is like got 10,000 or a yeah, something, or something, like something that, right? yeah, something like that. So, but if you wanted to double the block size, if you wanted to quadruple it or whatever, so more transactions could go in, that's something that would probably make people happy because it means that their their transactions would be processed quicker, less right. transaction fees, um, which might grow overall usage of the network. But from a minor point of view that operates on very, very thin margins, if they're all of a sudden going to allow four times as many transactions into a block, that means that uh, what's the impact on the fees that they're going to generate from that? The blocks will still be generated every 10 minutes, so they'll still get the same type. They'll still get the same um, reward fees from that, but, but there'll be less of them. Well, no, they'll still be the same amount of blocks and everything. But uh, I mean, people will pay a premium to get their transactions loaded into a block if there's a lot of congestion on the network. But all of a sudden, if the congestion goes away, I mean, maybe they were making $25, or I mean, that's just a made-up number, but $25 in fees for a block when we only allowed in 13 transactions, but what if if we let in 60, we only make $10 a block now in fees. All of a sudden that hurts your economics. And again, you're on razor thin margins. So those groups aren't always in, aren't always in sync. And, uh, and, and because there's no formal governance mechanism, there's no real way to arbitrate this except in Twitter and Reddit and on, on phone calls. Ah, Twitter. So <laughs> yeah, that's so, the new governance mechanism. It, Twitter it, it and is. And, but I mean, there are, there are phone, I mean, it's true though. I mean, people, they, yeah, it is, but uh, it's a um, scary um, thought because it's a, such a polarized. Well, it is, but platform, I, but I, but, but I think I, I tend to think that the most serious people stay off of Twitter for those purposes. I mean, the the real, the real important discussions don't tend to happen on Twitter. They happen on Telegram, but uh, yes, that's true. But but or 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 conference calls or they'll get together for for meetings and stuff. But but at the same time, because there's no one at the end of the day that can make a final call, uh, what ends up happening is you get forks where people kind of go in their separate directions. How many forks of Bitcoin have there been? Oh, I don't know about that. There's some major. Well, well, uh, like and, well, well, for one thing, Bitcoin's an open protocol, so theoretically anybody could fork it. You and I could and, and set it up ourselves. So, right. But I mean, there's been I guess like four or five major ones. I mean, right. Bitcoin, like Bitcoin, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Gold, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Unlimited, and then um, within Bitcoin Cash, and there were a couple that just recently forked to create uh, Bitcoin SV, um, uh, gotcha. which is run by Craig Wright, the, who claims to be Satoshi. Although uh, most people, um, everyone knows that I'm Satoshi. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, just by the, the way. I was thinking about this. You know, it takes so much time to actually create a protocol. There's no way that just there was one person doing it. I just don't see how you, how there's there's teams of developers that are trying to create these protocols mm -hmm. now. I don't know how one person could have done it. But. Well, uh, e even if he's one person, I mean, I, I even think that in his white paper, he or she in, in, in their white paper, right. I mean, they acknowledge that it's built on top of work that's been previously done. I mean, it utilizes like asymmetric cryptography and, and, and public key infrastructure. Satoshi didn't create that. I mean, that, that's been around that's been around for decades. Right. Um, so, I mean, or hashing algorithm. I mean, he, those were not created. There are some there are some cryptocurrencies out there that 
have created their own like uh, their own hashing algorithm that they claim is more secure than ones that are more publicly out there. But I mean, it, basically, the point is, I mean, he acknowledges that basically he he didn't invent all the different pieces that went into Bitcoin or he, he or she, all the pieces just found a really innovative way to bring it all together to solve a problem that wasn't able to be done before. Right. So you, even if he or she is one person that definitely did not create get all of it himself. And, and, and that kind of goes to the whole point. I mean, anything that any of us build, I mean, most of it's not, even if the genesis of the idea is our own, it's built on top of prior knowledge that we've gotten from other places. Right. It's like the concept that there's no original thought. It's the same thing, right? <clears throat> okay. So I know that you have to get going soon. So let's kind of roll towards the end a little mm-hmm. bit. So I'd like to hear your biggest business lesson that you ever learned. My biggest business lesson. Yeah. The um, most important, biggest, biggest failure, whatever you want to talk about. I, I guess my biggest business lesson was probably just to learn to ask for help when you need it. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of times when, uh, there's been a lot of times when like, we're all ambitious people. We want to, boil the ocean or move mountains or whatever uh, whatever uh, sort of phrase you want to use but at the same time you can't do everything and uh, and you have to acknowledge what your limitations are and also like what your special skill sets are not and be able to ask for help and, and delegate which isn't an easy thing to do because people it sometimes it's hard to trust but you have to um, I mean for for yourself and for your organization you have to be able to do that okay so now Tell us what's going on for you. What do you have planned at the moment? Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. L- let's hear it. Yeah. So, so the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, uh, uh, as as you said in the beginning, we are a 501c6 nonprofit trade association. We're a global organization that advocates for the comprehensive adoption of blockchain and crypto assets across all aspects of capital markets and financial services. We um, we're based in New York, but we have locations in London, Sydney, or uh, we're opening up one in Shanghai, so we're expanding globally. And, and what we're really focusing on this year is trying to identify and promote those use cases that are not necessarily the low-hanging fruit, but low-hanging fruit, but the most relevant for capital markets and, and financial services. Because in order for us to reverse this bear market, we need to f- get actual tangible traction that is sustainable, not just built on hyperbole like the ICO craze was. So that's what we're focusing on. We have a number of different working groups from the accounting working group, we have enterprise solutions one, we have a legal working group, we have a technology working group, we have a crypto assets working group, and we also have a real estate working group. So we're looking at all those different aspects and uh, we're always looking for new members who are uh, professionals in the financial services space that would like to join. We're gonna be hosting a, a, an exclusive event with the government of Malta, the finance minister, uh, the CEO of the Malti Stock Exchange, the Maltese ambassador to the United States, a number of other dignitaries there for our members. So. So we're doing a lot of interesting stuff aside from plenty of other events we have planned out through the rest of the year. But really excited to be a part of this organization. I mean, I, I know Paul Sinelli is, uh, is, is, is a good friend of ours, too. And, and you've been a tremendous uh, supporter of the group. And you run one of our work streams within the legal group. So so it's a lot of fun there to have you to have you on. Oh, thank you. And uh, But, yeah, I mean, I, I see our mission as, as critical, as does plenty of other tr- – a lot of other trade associations trade associations in the space, but I, I do believe we operate in a unique space. And, and one of the things that I think also makes us really relevant and unique is that we don't we don't we don't choose winners and losers. We're agnostic in the sense that we advocate for both public and permission approaches, as I was talking about earlier when I mentioned uh, decentralized identity. I think there's use cases for for permission ledgers and and open ones. It just depends on who the customer is, the user, what what the use case is. So I mean I don't I don't think anybody who is and any reasonable person would be able to choose p- winners and losers at this point anyway, and we're not bold enough to try. That's a that's probably a good idea. So now, where do you think the next set of adoptions are going to come from? It could be in digital identity or, or or some other spot. Since you're you have your hands in so many different things, I'm I'm just curious to hear what you see. So I, I still think that one of the bigger adoption cases is is going to be one of the first ones that was talked about: um, back end clearance and settlement of securities. I mean, I know that uh, Digital Asset Holdings has been in the news a lot recently because they lost Blythe Masters, who I think came over. At, she was previously an MD at uh, Chase, I believe, right? Yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it was Chase, and, and she's widely credited with creating the uh, uh, inventing the credit default swap, which may or may not be a, 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 something <laughs> somewhat good. somewhat dubious. But 
but nevertheless, I mean, I mean, she came over to crypto and, and of, of Wall Street fame, and she was a real legitimizing force for the industry. Uh, she left EIH, but before she did, they secured a, a, a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract to revamp the chess system that ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange, uses to, um, to process orders or process trades. And uh, although it's been a little bit out of the news recently, I think in the next two years, that's supposed to go live. So that's a, that would be a very big deal. That's That'd be one of the few like real big enterprise implementation implementations of the space. Uh, DTCC is actually um, moving part of its $11 trillion uh, uh, um, warehouse onto the blockchain. So, so those are a few use cases that I'm really bullish on. Identity is something that I uh, identity is something that I'm really excited about for, for obvious reasons. I, I don't know quite, I don't know quite how quickly that's going to be adopted because there's technological challenges to all the pieces, being able to put it together and then create a user experience, a, a user interface that is seamless and as easy as people expect now that they have Facebook and Google and so on and so forth. So so I don't know, but but I definitely think that that's worth continuing to follow. It strikes me that given Facebook's interest in digital assets, and I, don't, I, don't, I haven't really dug into the level of what they want to do, but perhaps since they're a giant identity platform, they may have something to do with it. Yeah, and and I know that Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, he wrote something a, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, like this whole like treatise on 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 trying to create more privacy. Uh, I think like encrypting messaging on on Messenger and, and things like that too. Uh, That's look, what WhatsApp is and yeah, yeah. Telegram and, and yeah, and uh, and also looking at I think trying to use some sort of like decentralized login or identifier so they don't have to rely on Facebook servers. But at the end of the day, I mean, for one, it's very why is it in their financial interest to, to do so? I mean, they have such a profitable business nowadays. I mean, if they're going to go that approach, it's obviously going to cannibalize part of their revenue stream. So if they're going to do it, they're going to have to find the right time. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's there. Plus, again, to run a platform like Facebook, it is so computationally expensive and laborious that there's no blockchain system that could do it these days. I mean, there's no blockchain system that you could run Facebook on top of and have the same, have that number of users and make it run so quickly and, and, and host so many pictures and, and all that sort of stuff. So if they were going to move in that regard, I mean, that would have to be a complete reversal of their system architecture that, again, if they're going to, they would have to answer a lot of tough questions to their investors if they were going, if they were going to go that route. So it sounds like that may happen on the next social platform, not Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think that a lot of times when we start talking about that, when will identity be adopted and, and when will we switch from Facebook? To, it, it, that may not be the right answer. It might be, for instance, we look at uh, registering IDs for devices on a blockchain, uh, like Amazon Alexas and refrigerators and light bulbs and all that sort of stuff, and and sort of see what business models grow out of that versus... So versus, Internet of Things. Yeah, that basically IoT as opposed to like us, all of us moving our data onto, onto, onto Facebook. Like that... Uh, the transition for that would be would be would be difficult. I mean, the one thing that potentially could aid that is within the GDPR. There is a uh, there's a requirement in the GDPR that people have the right to data portability. Right. Basically, that that means that they have the right to say that hey, Facebook or a bank or wh whoever uh, they, they use the term data controller to to sort of uh, categorize who who controls the data. That within like X number of days, if I request my data, you have to give it to me all of it to me and I can go give it to somebody else. I mean, there are, there are some restrictions on that. Like for instance, like financial services, they have to hold on to transaction data for five, 10 years, whatever it is to, um, does it self destruct after it's, uh, after it's taken it's out? It's supposed to, well, I mean, that, that's, well, if you take it out, you're supposed to, um, destroy all copies, give the original, the digital originals over or something like that. I, I mean, I don't, I mean, if people felt formed, I don't know if they, but I mean, the only copy, I, if, if you give it to them, um, well, I, mean, I guess it could be two different things. I mean, one, if it, if you just want to port, you can request that they delete the data if they don't need it anymore. That's the right to erasure or, or what's more commonly known as the right to be forgotten. I mean, you can, if you want, you can tell them, I want my data. You can still keep it because I want to keep using your services, but I also want to use those. It's not, I don't think it's a binary question. Gotcha. All right. Very interesting. Okay. So let's get your Twitter handle, your LinkedIn, any other media that you use. And now we'll wrap it up. Sure. Um, so my Twitter is uh, at Stephen underscore Ehrlich. It's spelled uh, S-T-E-V-E-N underscore Ehrlich, uh, E-H-R-L-I-C-H. I, -H -I uh, 
guessing you'll probably put that in the show notes as well. We will, yes, that's right. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, I guess look, just look me up, Steve Ehrlich at uh, WSBA. And, and thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, Steve. Well, it's been fun.